Hello everyone, this is John Buck, back with yet another Discrete Time Linear Systems video. Uh, and this one is a great one because in this one we talk about how poles and zeros uh, impact the, the frequency response of a system. So again, bringing together different topics uh, from different parts of the semester. And, and I really like telling this story uh, because uh, this explains things I've shown you and you've had to accept on faith about what happens like in second order systems when R gets closer to one, why the peaks get sharper. Uh, and things like that. In this video and the next one, I'll be able to explain uh, with an, why that happens with a nice geometric picture uh, for where how things in the frequency response depend on poles and zeros. All right, so let's uh, pause the video and I'll switch over to the whiteboard and show you how that works. So again, our, our, our topic for this video is poles, zeros, and the frequency response and how they're connected. Uh, if we start with a, a classic rational uh, system, right? It has the frequency response that looks like this, but we know if I want to find poles and zeros, I need to factor it. And when I factor it, a polynomial, I'm writing it as a product of a whole bunch of terms. I may have a, a constant gain in front, but instead of a, a sum, we often write this with a capital pi for product. We could say I could write this as a product of m terms, each of which will have some different coefficient. So I'll call it c sub l of z to the minus one, right? Where these c's are the roots of the numerator, right? Those are, if I rewrite the polynomial in its factored form instead of a sum form, I'd have a product of all these roots in the numerator and then a similar product as k goes from one to n of one minus, uh, we'll say d sub k z to the minus one. These are the roots of the denominator or the poles. So when I write it in this form, I, I write it in the factored form, I can then say, well, if I want to find the uh, Fourier transform magnitude, I first set z equal to e to the j omega and then take the magnitude. So on the right hand side, I'll get the magnitude of a product is the product of the magnitude. So that means I can bring this all the way inside Right, this big product and also the product of a quotient. So it says I'm getting a product of the find the frequency response. When I set z equal e to the j omega, z to the minus one becomes e to the minus j omega. It says my frequency response takes the form of this product in the numerator and the product in the denominator similarly of a magnitude of one minus d sub k e to the minus j omega. So it says I have all these, the product of all these different magnitudes of complex numbers that change with omega, right? They change with omega, but they're dependent on these c sub uh, l's, which are the zeros. If I change the zeros or I change the poles, I'll change the Fourier transform magnitude. And now we're going to do something that's one of the big picture stories of this class is when you get a large complicated system, think about how to break it down into smaller pieces think hard about those small pieces and then build it back up. So we're going to now in this video and the next one talk about what ha would happen if I had just a single zero, right? If the, if the only thing that mattered was a single term in the numerator, so if I can understand that and then I get zeros that aren't too far apart, I can sort of reconnect them and think about what's going on. And similarly, we'll talk about a single first order pole in the following video and how these things connect up. All right, so if I think about uh, my, my frequency response for a single zero, again, I'd start by setting z equal to e to the j omega. So when I do that, I have a z, e, z is e to the j omega, a 1 minus a, uh, e to the minus j omega. And again, I'm going to assume my a, I'll, I'll need it in a little while, has a polar form where this r is the radius or magnitude, right, and the theta is the angle. And that will be helpful in a minute when I'm going to draw a geometric picture about this. And so now if I want to take the magnitude of this, I'm also going to do one of these annoying things professors do, which is I'm going to factor it in a strange way that only makes sense because I know the final answer I'm trying to get to, which is I'm going to pull an e to the j omega out front, which at first looks like is making things more complicated. But so my one becomes an e to the plus j omega minus a. I have the magnitude of this product. I can write as the product of the magnitudes. Right, the magnitude of e to the minus j omega 
the magnitude of e to the j omega minus a, where a may be a complex number. There's possibly a complex number. And when I do that, this first term has magnitude 1, right? This is a, a e to the minus j omega has, has sort of a, a, you know, essentially if I wrote this in polar form, it's got a, a 1 hidden in front. So the magnitude of this is always 1. And when I, so when I do that, what I find is that the magnitude of h of e to the j omega is the magnitude of the complex number of e to the minus j omega minus a. But if I think about uh, e to the j omega and a as complex numbers, then the difference between them is a vector. If I subtract two complex numbers, I can represent that as another complex number in the, the real imaginary plane. And the magnitude of that vector is the length, right? If I look at it graphically, the magnitude of that complex number is the length of the vector between them. So let's see how this, this works out on, on the next page if I draw an example. So here's a, an example with, I've drawn a very large unit circle. I haven't drawn it the whole way around because we're going to work, in this example, I've just put it in the, the first quadrant. So here's my, uh, if I say the point z equals e to the j omega, that's somewhere on the unit circle, right, where this angle here is omega, right? As omega increases, I'm driving around the unit circle like it's the ring road. A here in, in this picture I've drawn, just for instance, right, here's my r and theta. Remember we said A in complex form, or in polar form, it's a complex number with polar form r, which is the radius, how far the zero lies out from the origin. And then theta is the angle of that. And so if I think about what I had up on the previous page, the magnitude of the frequency response is the magnitude of the complex number e to the minus j omega minus a. So as omega, as I keep changing omega, right, I'm running around all these different complex numbers, and this will change. But like I said, taking the difference of these two is a vector. I'm going to draw that vector in blue, right? So it's, if I take the difference, remembering back to Cal 2 or, or complex number, oh, I didn't draw that very well. Let me undo that. Let me see, I could actually use the, uh, the line tool, right, to draw a good vector. Right, so it's that vector there. Oh, I should have done undone the first one. Right, so it's this vector here. Is e to the j omega minus a. Right, that's that's the difference of the two. Is the vector that goes from a to e to the j omega. So the magnitude of e to the j omega minus a is the length of that vector. So as I change to different values of omega running around the unit circle, I'm going to keep getting new vectors. Right? As omega increases, this point is moving along the unit circle, and I'm going to get new vectors like this. And we can see these vectors are getting shorter and shorter. That means as omega increases, in fact, I could go back to, like the first point at omega equals 0 was down here. So this, the length of this vector if I, if I measured it all out carefully with a ruler, would tell me over here, if I go over to my, my magnitude plot, would tell me the value at omega equals zero here. And as I'm moving, as omega is increasing, this is going down. And so I want you to think about, well, what value of omega will minimize the length of that vector and therefore also minimize the magnitude of the frequency response? Pause the video for a second and think about it, and then come back when you think you have an answer. Okay, well, we say when it, where's the vector going to be shortest? It's going to be when I'm the closest point to the unit circle would be right there. I guess I should have kept it blue, but we'll, we'll live with this, right? So the length of this vector here is, is uh, 1 minus a, right? If the whole thing is from, is radius 1, and then I've got a, or I'm sorry, r, 1 minus r. There's r from here to the 0, then it's 1 minus r for the rest of it. So if I were drawing this, this would come down gradually, bottom out, have my minimum from the zero at theta, and then go back up again. And as I go further and further around, that vector is getting longer and longer. But at a certain point, oh, it's still the wrong color. Let's go back to the blue. At a certain point, it's getting longer and longer, right? But at a certain point, that's getting more and more gradually. As I get further away, the sort of how much it changes 
the frequency is getting less and less. So it's, it's still growing, but it grows more slowly as I get out there. And I end up with something like this until I get all the way out at pi. So I'll see a notch that, that you know, from a point of view of a sort of rough frequency response, I'll see a notch, whoop, a notch here at theta, and then it will grow again, but more slowly as I move away. And the height of this notch will be 1 minus r. So the closer the zero gets to the unit circle, the deeper and sharper this will be, and it'll turn out to be, be a sharper one. So for example, if I imagine I'm going to draw a new zero, imagine that zero is much closer to the unit circle out here. So this is my new value of a. What would happen? Well, this vector would be very short, right? If I sort of go through the same exercise here, this would be maybe a little shorter, but not too different. And initially, they wouldn't be so bad. But as it got close, these vectors get very short, right? So that's there's this region close to the unit circle where I very quickly drop down. And then as I move out again, these are not too different in length. Right? Especially as I get out here, I sort of look at these triangles. The two sides are getting pretty similar. So I'd have something that sort of starts similar. Maybe it's slightly shorter. Oh, I need to make a free curve. And at some point, it's going to drop really sharply and then come up again and eventually be like that. I think it should always be under the other one. But it's going to be a sharper. And, and so this this 1 minus r would, you know, this green version is r is closer to the unit circle. I still have the, the notch at the same place, but it's getting deeper and deeper and, and, and reacting more severely from that. All right, so that helps us see that if I looked at just the zero, one zero, and maybe if I have a bunch of zeros, I'll be multiplying things like this together. And most of the places, they're pretty smooth. And just near the zeros themselves, I'll get notches, and they'll be broader or deeper, um, broader and deeper depending on how close they are to the unit circle, how, how sharp they are. So one way to think about this is, is almost like I'm driving around the campus ring road, and these zeros are like big sinkholes that have opened up on campus. There, if I'm on the ring road, is that sinkhole get, is if that sinkhole is close to the circuit, to the ring road, it's going to pull the surface down. I'm going to go down through a valley, and the closer it is to the ring road, the deeper and sharper the valley will be. All right, so I'm going to stop here for next this video. That's all for this time. The next video will do the same story for poles. I'll see you there.